The Mindful Life Practice. All right. I think I'm also feeling kind of tired today because I am... Um, so in Ramadan in the Middle East, some of the local people have to work out after they've eaten. So anyway, I'm teaching this class. Started at 9.30 p.m. last night, but then the woman who booked me, she said it's, it's actually too early, so it's going to be 10 p.m. from now on. <laughs> so I'm going to have to rearrange my schedule. I can't do a morning class the day after. Not a thing. <laughs> Um, let's come into a, a child's pose to start. I really like to start in child's pose. You can support your knees with like a blanket or a cushion. Good to have pillows nearby. And then just kind of bring your body into stillness. Oh, I'm feeling like I need a good stretch. Need a good hour of grounding. As you drop into stillness and drop into your breath, just make sure that your phone is off, that any and all distractions are set aside. And that you devote this hour to being present, being connected, being in your body, being in your breath. So we're gonna move through, I always try to mix it up and then I always end up coming back to the basics. Really, I think the biggest area of the body that, that needs a lot of love and attention often is our hips. We'll get some deep hip stretching. We'll do a little bit of spinal stretching, a little bit of stuff for the neck. kind of creating space where we feel tight. Creating openness. So when I started the 30 day yoga challenge, that was 28 days ago now, was it April 28th already? Yeah, how crazy is that? We've been online on this Zoom yoga studio for five weeks. So when I started this challenge, I had an intention of moving through all of the yamas and niyamas of yoga, talking about philosophy. And we've made it so far to the third niyama. And the third niyama is one that I really like. It's called tapas. And tapas is an interesting one. I think when I was first introduced to it, I didn't really get what it meant.
what tapas really means is your commitment commitment to show up every day And I think it's an especially relevant one for, for those of us doing the yoga challenge, for those of us part of this. Tonight, as we move through our poses, we're gonna be kind of weaving around and exploring this topic. How can I embody tapas? How can I live tapas? How can it be part of my yoga practice, part of my life? Now let's take one more round of breath in the child's pose. And we're going to slowly just come all the way up. We're do a tiny little bit of movement. So first, just tuck your toes under. You're going to sit your hips back and rest on your heels. And if this is too much with your toes tucked under, you can always have your feet flat like that. That's okay. But if you're good here with the toes tucked and the soles of the feet stretching, we're gonna drop one earlobe down towards the side. And then either stay here or land your right palm being a little bit of an anchor and you should feel a stretch through your left trapezius muscle. While you're stretching there, I'm going to turn off one of my lights. I have these lighting boards so that it's bright for you guys to see. There, that's better. But because it's a yin class, I kind of want a bit more like relaxing, relaxing light. I think that's better. Let's take a few deep breaths. And then take your head all the way up through center. And then we're just going to take it the opposite way. So take your left palm up, drop your left earlobe towards your left shoulder. Maybe you land your left palm, just getting a nice stretch through your right traps muscle. And bring your head all the way up through center. Just take your chin into your chest and then just rock the chin back and forth from side to side, taking these like little half circle things. And then just bring the head all the way back up through center. Let's plant the palms. And then just kind of massage the feet. And then we're going to take it into a spinal twist. Okay, so leave your left palm where it is. Take your right arm up towards the sky, big stretch. And then thread your right arm all the way under, landing onto the right cheek and 
right shoulder and maybe lifting the opposing arm, wrapping around the back body. back through center and then let's twist the opposite way so taking your left arm all the way up towards the sky and then threading your left arm all the way under Coming all the way back, landing both of the palms. And now just give yourself a few moments to just kind of move in whatever way makes sense for you. And then we're gonna come all the way back into neutral. Let's just do one down dog, just one. Tucking your toes, lifting all the way up and back. And then you're gonna bend through the knees and gaze forward and then just step the feet up to meet the hands. All right, so we're gonna take a forward fold and I'm gonna give you two options. You can take your traditional dangle pose bending the knees, gripping opposite elbows, dropping the head. Or you can take this pose, we took it in restorative yoga on Thursday. You're gonna come towards a wall if you have a wall and then forward fold in front of the wall and then walk your feet in. And what this is gonna do is it's just gonna like create you know, a bit of resistance for you to deepen further into this hamstring stretch. Um, if it's too much for you, then just do a normal forward fold, right? You do not have to do this at all. We are gonna be here for about three minutes. So choose a pose that is sustainable for you. So when I first started yoga, I did a 30 day yoga challenge. And I really got um, committed to showing up every day for this practice. And I I remember meeting this guy at the studio, just a guy I met at the end of a class one day. He was a really memorable person. And I think he could tell that I was like kind of new at yoga. I don't know how he could tell that. <laughs> but um, I remember him saying to me, I've been practicing yoga for for over a decade and the key thing is that you should never miss a day. And it was a memorable conversation for me because at that time I had like so little barriers to showing up for yoga. Right, I lived within walking distance of my yoga studio. I was working at the studio, I was cleaning the studio in exchange for free classes, so. I was able to go to the studio affordably. 
you know, geographically there was no barrier. And at that time in my life, it was really easy to stay committed to this practice. And since leaving that situation, I've had some really kind of ebbing and flowing times of my life when I've been able to stay committed to yoga and times when I really lost it. We're just going to stay in this forward fold for five more breaths. And then slowly, if you're against the wall, just walk away from the wall. You're gonna slowly roll all the way up to stand. And we're gonna do something different today. We're gonna to take our mountain pose as a rebound pose. So let your vertebrae stack upon vertebrae and let your arms be open, palms facing forward. And just kind of feel the effects of that posture on the body, on the nervous system. into the hips. So come towards your mat. We're going to take our two classic, my favorite, yin poses. They just kind of do the trick. We're going to pair lizard or dragon and then pigeon. Okay. So let's start first with our lizard. Landing your left knee, stepping your right foot forward. If you want to cushion the knee, go ahead. And then either being on the palms or landing the elbows. And then you decide what you're doing with the right knee. You can open it towards the side. Maybe roll onto the outer edge of the foot. And so we're going to be here as well for about three minutes. So tapas or, or commitment to our practice. So the first time I really experienced barriers towards my yoga practice was when I moved to Kuwait. So in my first year living in Kuwait, um, the nearest place where I could teach yoga was, was called the Hilton Resort. And it was about 10 minutes from where I lived. I was the only yoga teacher. And I really loved teaching the classes there, but I think it's really important when you're on the path of yoga that you find a community that can support you. If that makes sense. And so while the Hilton was fine, um, there were no other yoga teachers. There were no other people that were like living the same lifestyle I was. And it was really hard to be inspired. It was really hard to feel connected. It's hard to feel committed. And I remember that at the end of that year, I went home to Toronto and I took the first yoga class that I had taken in an entire year and I sobbed, I cried.
And then the following year, I moved back to Kuwait and I was like, I need to fix this. And so I found a yoga studio, the only yoga studio I could find. And it was an hour drive one way from my apartment. <laughs> and my work day ended at 2 p.m. The first yoga class wasn't till 4.30. So I would finish at work and I would wait around for two hours <laughs> and I would take whatever class was on that day <laughs> and then start that long hour long drive home. Let's take one more breath. And then we're going to come up onto the palms. And we're not going to do a rebound between sides. We're going to move directly into our pigeon, our sleeping swan. So you're going to walk your right foot across, lay the right shin across the width of the mat, taking a big breath in, and then hinging your body forward. And you can support yourself however you like. I'm going to grab my pillow and then bring it forward. And so that yoga studio really saved me, but it was also really hard for me to access yoga, right? It was a 60 minute drive. I couldn't do it every day. And especially when I was not in the mood to do yoga, it was really hard to motivate myself to get there. So I remember when I moved to Abu Dhabi, when I got this job offer, the first thing I did when researching this city was I looked up all the yoga studios and I saw how far of a drive it would be. <laughs> and the biggest issue that I had in Abu Dhabi was not the drive to yoga. There are studios like, you know, 20, 30, 15 minutes from where I live. The biggest barrier I had when I first moved here was money. Um, I didn't have a car yet. I had to pay for a taxi. I had to pay for individual classes before I became a teacher and was able to get a benefit. But yoga just became really, really expensive. Let's just take one more breath. And then we're gonna make our way up. We're gonna come into a rebound. You're gonna feel this pose on the right side. So I'm just gonna come down to lay on my belly, but you can choose what you wanna take. Just give yourself this full minute to feel how the right side is compared to the left. Has anything moved or shifted within your body? Has any space been created? How does your right side feel compared to your left? And just slowly start to make your way up. And we're going to 
gonna take this sequence of poses on the opposite side. So the first is that lizard or dragon. And you might be good up here on the palms. You might come down onto the elbows. So back to my long winded story about my commitment to yoga. When I finally got a yoga teaching job here in Abu Dhabi, it was not at a, a yoga centered studio. Right, the room was a spinning studio and had pump, had shape, had other workouts, but I would only teach one. I was like the one yoga class person teaching at night. And it was amazing because like, that's how I became a bar instructor. It's how I became a spinning instructor. It opened my mind to like so many other types of fitness. But again, it's like something was missing for me. And I think this all ties into this whole theme of tapas, right? Tapas is the fire within us. Tapas is the commitment that we will show up for our yoga practice even when we don't feel like it. Because we know that on days when we don't feel like it, it's when we need it the most. But if you don't have this community that's going to support you around that, and if you don't have, you know, accessibility to yoga, you don't have, um, if there are barriers to it, then it's really hard to keep that fire alive. It's really hard to keep that tapas going. So anyway, all this is to say that, <laughs> you know, that guy told me never miss a day. That's the key. And uh, of course, at that point, I would have never predicted that I'd move to the Middle East and that there would be so many barriers getting in the way of me and my yoga. But, you know, when, you, when I say that I've been teaching and practicing yoga for 10 years, it hasn't always been consistent and constant. There's been ebbs and flows in my life, times when I've lost it, times when I've gained it back. We're just gonna take about five more breaths in this lizard. And then we're gonna make our way all the way up. And we're gonna be coming directly into the second side or the second pose into the pigeon. So taking the shin across the width of the mat, just kind of shuffling your knee back until you create space. And then taking a breath in. And then on your exhale, coming forward. And so one of the best things about starting the mindful life practice is it's not only like, I'm making this commitment to show up to teach, but the commitment of all of you showing up to practice and the commitment of all of our growing team of yoga teachers showing up all around the world and this community that's been brought together. Our classes are slightly smaller this week, but that's not because we're getting smaller. It's because we now offer four classes a day. 
and I'm present in all of them. And I see all of the people that we're touching all around the world coming in and out all throughout the day. And it's really amazing how we built this community that has inspired each other. It certainly inspired me. And I would say of all of my years in the Middle East, this is probably the most committed that I have ever been to my yoga practice. Definitely back in the day when I lived in Canada, I, that was probably the most committed I've been in my life. <laughs> but of my time in the Middle East, this has been the most committed I've been. I don't know if anyone else here feels the same way. We're just gonna be in this pigeon for five more breaths. And just start to make your way up. You're going to shift to one side. Just finding your way into your rebound pose. I'm going to lie on my back this time, but it's up to you. You can be seated. You can be on your belly. And take one more round of breath. And we're going to move into my least favorite yoga pose. <laughs> we're going to move into a wide-legged forward fold. So you're going to come to sit on cushion or blanket or whatever. Spread your heels wide. And then you can either stay upright Or you might slowly start walking your palms forward, just kind of spilling at the hips. You can land at the elbows. I want to share with you this passage from my teacher Rolf's book. Master sticks to her tools. Lao Tzu. So Lao Tzu captured the essence of abhyasa or practice. We get the job. We don't get the job. We get married. We don't get married. 
Our family is well. Our family is troubled. Our friends flourish. Our friends founder. Our demons are melting away. Our demons are at the door. We wake up with a love for life. We wake up with a free floating anxiety. We feel worthy of love in our life. We feel unworthy of love in our life. And through it all though, we come back to the mat. We return to the meditation cushion. And we do the next right thing. So I think there's times when we don't want to show up for yoga. I actually themed a class on this last week. Last Thursday, I ordered a pizza for lunch and I ate the whole thing. <laughs> and by the time the afternoon bar class came around, I felt awful and I didn't want to teach. <laughs> but I had to show up because I have a commitment. And by the end of the class, I was feeling so much better. Whenever you don't feel like moving, moving is always the answer. Moving will always make you feel better. I think Rolf really captures the essence of this in his writing. This is tapas. Us continuously showing up for ourselves and the community. us continuing to commit to this practice. Let's take five more breaths. Just slowly start to peel all the way up. And then you can pick your rebound pose. I'm just gonna come into a crisscross. Just kind of breathe the benefits of that practice. Finish it off with a spinal twist. So I'm going to come into um, a twisted root. You could always just stack your knees 
and open your arms and drop the knees to one side, that is an option. But if you do want to take a little bit of a deeper spinal twist, I'm going to cross my right thigh on top of my left and then drop both knees over to the left and then send my gaze over to the right. Maybe as you're kind of resting in this spinal twist, thinking about how you can cultivate tapas in your life. And tapas doesn't necessarily have to mean, you know, you show up for yoga every day. Although for myself, I've found that commitment very helpful. Because <laughs> as soon as you skip days, then you have excuses. But yoga every day might not be for everyone. I show commitment and tapas in my life. It could just be commitment to, you know, the way you breathe. Taking moments throughout the day to take deep breaths, that's yoga. It could be a commitment to right thought or right speech, like Thinking about the things you say, are they true and kind and necessary? That's yoga. Maybe it's not every single day, but maybe you'll commit to twice a week coming and that's yoga. Pantanjali's yoga sutras are awesome because they give us these commitments, but they don't tell us how to embody them, how to live them, how to practice them. Right? That's up to you. Take one more breath in this spinal twist. And then we're gonna unwind and take the opposite side. So open the arm, draw the knees all the way back. And then let's switch our twist. So land and cross the left knee and then slide your hips to the side and then drop your gaze in the opposite direction. Be here for three minutes before our final resting pose. Now, tapas is often directly translated as fire. When I used to teach this yin class on Tuesday night, I always had nice smelling candles reason I don't have them anymore is because, well, bath and body work, these candles are expensive. <laughs> Haven't gotten my salary yet. <laughs> so hopefully if I'm paid soon, I can bring some candles back into the space. One meditation that one of my yoga teachers um, encourages is like a meditation on a candle flame. And 
don't know if you've ever experienced like sitting around a fire or an open flame or even a candle and just been captivated by it. There's something super meditative about fires. And for me, it's um, a huge part of my culture growing up in Canada. We had fires all the time, campfires. Gaze at the fire. So if you do have candles at home, That might be one nice thing to do to meditate on the flame. See what that experience is like. Take one more round of breath in this twist. And slowly unwind. And you decide how you want to take your final resting pose. If you want to take a Shavasana, go ahead. I'm going to scooch forward and come to my seated meditation. Make sure you choose a pose that is restful for you. I want to lead you through a meditation. Um, I led it through some of my classes on Saturday, so you might have heard it before. It's a mountain meditation. It's about getting grounded. It's good for illuminating inner strength, bringing yourself back to the center, which are all themes around tapas. So whether you're on your back or sitting tall, just observe the breath without interfering. And then picture your favorite mountain. Imagine its shape. Is it tall or steeply sloping? Do its roots spread wide? Is it massive and solid? Sit and breathe with this image as if you're inhaling this mountain into your being. Making it part of you. And feel the majesty of the mountain within. Keep visualizing the mountain within as if your head were the peak and your body the depth and the breadth of the mountain. Your legs are the roots burrowing into the soil. And 
as you feel the body of the mountain within your body, sense as if it's lifting you upward and filling you outward. Seeing the sun rise and fall, the stars emerge in their millions. The moon radiate on your slopes. See summer with its brightness merge into autumn. And as the leaves start to fall, you let go a little more. The winter comes and brings more weather that cloaks your body. Softly mounts to spring. And all of this time you are unmoving. You are accepting of all the seasons. The light and dark, the cold and the warmth. Everything in our lives, it's constantly changing. Nature, our bodies, our minds. And like the mountain, we have periods of light and dark, warmth and coldness, joy and sorrow, the weather of our mind. Can you sit amidst it all in calm abidance, feeling at ease within your body? In this moment, can you feel equanimous and non-reactive to the ever-changing kaleidoscope of your life? Feel as if you are this mountain. Accepting all and rejecting nothing. seated meditation, just stay. If you're on your back in your Shavasana, make your way up to the seated shape. Lengthen up your spine and sit tall and proud like you are that strong mountain. Then dig your palms into your heart center. Humble your chin into your chest. We close with the intention. It's the ancient intention and perhaps 
the original intention. It's that our yoga practice remains steady. We have the tapas or the commitment or the zeal, the austerity to carry it through. And that this yoga practice serves and benefits not only our being, but all beings everywhere. May all beings be safe. May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy and free. May the thoughts and actions of each of our lives contribute towards this. So if you wanna join me for an OM, we're gonna inhale, exhale, and then inhale through to make an OM. Okay, taking a breath in. And then a breath out. And a breath in. Thank you for showing up, for sharing the space and the practice. Om Shanti Shanti Peace. Namaste. Full Life Practice.